You're listening to 15 Minutes, where we feature community leaders sharing what the rest of us should know but likely don't. Hi, Chad Franzen here, one of the hosts of Share Your Voice, where we talk with top-notch law firms and lawyers about what it takes to grow a successful law practice. This episode is brought to you by Gladiator Law Marketing, delivering tailor-made services to help you accomplish your objectives and maximize your growth potential. To have a successful marketing campaign and make sure you're getting the best ROI, your firm needs to have a better website and better content. Gladiator Law Marketing uses artificial intelligence, machine learning, and decades of experience to outperform the competition. To learn more, go to gladiatorlawmarketing.com, where you can schedule a free marketing consultation. Spencer Ehrenfeld of Ehrenfeld Trial Lawyers is an international authority on holding cruise lines accountable for prioritizing profits over passenger safety. After graduating cum laude from the University of Miami Law School in 1991, he founded his Coral Gables-based firm, dedicating his career to championing individuals against corporate juggernauts, including major cruise lines and companies like Bayer, Johnson & Johnson, and Walmart. He frequently lectures nationwide and several media platforms, including Dr. Phil, The Today Show on NBC, and Dateline NBC. His accolades also include being recognized as one of Florida's super lawyers and one of the 20 most intriguing Floridians by Florida Magazine. Spencer, it's great to have you today. How are you? Thank you so much, Chad. Thanks for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you. Hey, uh, how and when did you know that you wanted to be an attorney? I think it started off when I was in high school. Um, I I had an opportunity to sort of represent a seriously injured or ill, I should say, ill young lady who I grew up with fighting her parking tickets. Uh, She was disabled, but didn't have a disabled uh, sticker. And the school had just given her like 30 parking tickets. And I, and I said, let me go see if I can solve this issue for you. I had no idea that she was critically ill. And I went in there and presented the case. I get a little emotional even thinking about it because it was a young lady I grew up with. And I just had my 40th high school reunion. And of course she wasn't there. And, um, and, and I, I, I walked into the principal's office and of course I'm with this I didn't know just how sick she was, but it was obvious to the principal that this was a very sick child, or maybe he knew, and he immediately tore the tickets up. But I felt this great sense of happiness, being able to help somebody. And I was like, wow, um, maybe this is something I should explore. I didn't know how, I didn't know in, in what format. And of course, you know, I was 17. So I wasn't really necessarily thinking that this is why I should be a lawyer, but it planted a seed that grew within me. And then, you know, as I, as I went to college and started thinking about things in life, that episode was so important in my decision-making um, that I, I, I gravitated towards this. And, um, and even once I got to law school, the idea of being a personal injury lawyer was very discouraged in my law school at the University of Miami. Uh, my professors openly discouraged me from pursuing this, uh, but I liked the dynamic. Um, and one of the cases that we had in law school was uh, uh, an imaginary case, but a man who contracted AIDS when his condom broke and, and uh, sued the condom manufacturer. And a lot of students didn't want anything to do with that case. And I argued that case. I argued it from the side of the manufacturer, from the side of the man, back and forth and back and forth. We worked our way all the way up to winning the moot court competition because it, I was so passionate about it. Um, I'm not passionate about fighting over real estate deals. I'm not passionate about family law. I'm not passionate about criminal law. Um, I'm not passionate about adoption or entertainment law. Um, or anything like that, but the dynamic of holding the biggest possible corporate entity responsible when I'm representing the smallest and most vulnerable person is as thrilling to me today as it was then. I don't mean to cry on your podcast, but you asked me such a deeply personal question that I had to look deep within inside me to answer that from my heart, and and that is the... That is the truth. 
That's great. That, that, I think you probably uh, picked the wrong guy to be on your podcast. <laughs> that's sorry. fantastic. Don't mean to cry. <laughs> no, that's I, fantastic. Cry, baby. Um, what um, is there kind of a common thread? You know, people think like, "Why well, I, I have no chance against some of these ma- massive corporations, especially like a, like a person, you know, just an individual kind of everyday person." Is there yeah. like a common thread that has allowed you to be successful? in a lot of these cases? Well, um, many of my clients had doubts about whether or not we can hold the corporation responsible, but I have no doubt about it. So uh, I have a great de- degree of confidence uh, that we can ultimately hold the corporation responsible. I am not always right. And there have been many times in my, my career where a jury disagreed with my analysis of the case and my evidence um, so I'm not always right, but I, I always believe in the law and, and in the, the general concept that, you know, people are entitled to their day in court. I will tell you, I hate to, to, to plagiarize the expression of one of our most famed politicians, but the system is a little bit rigged and it's really rigged in favor of the corporations particularly in the area of maritime law, which is where I'm focusing most of my energy at this point in my career is seeing cruise lines. Boy, have the cruise lines got the law on their side. And so it is extremely difficult to hold a cruise line responsible, but we find a way to do it most of the time. So you uh, you founded Ehrenfeld Trial Lawyers um, after after graduating from the University of Miami Law School. What motivated yeah. you to start your own firm right out of school? It was really necessity. Even though I graduated at the top of my law school class, I couldn't get a job. Um, part of the problem was I didn't even know what kind of law. Um, I was so desperate for anything. I didn't know what kind of law that I would even be the right fit for. So I would go to these interviews and I'd go to this interview at some big fancy law firm, some corporate giant law firm. I didn't know. No one, no one explained any of this to me. And then I was obviously not a good match. <laughs> I mean, I, I reflect sometimes on how poorly my interviews went because I was talking about helping the little people and how important it was to hold corporations responsible. I was telling this to the people who defend the corporations. Oh. Um, so it, it wasn't a good match. As I was looking for a job, I was getting clients. And I was spending more time working on my clients' cases than looking for a job. And I didn't have an office or anything. So I started practicing law out of the law school library at the University of Miami. And I did so for months and months until somebody figured out what I was doing there. Um, but I had nowhere to go and nothing to do but but help these small individuals against whoever it was they were fighting. And, and it, it, it sort of turned into a law firm in spite of itself. And before I knew it, I had enough business that I moved out of the library. I subled an office. I started hiring my classmates to assist me because I had classmates also who were unemployed and it grew into a law firm. And uh, that was in 1991 and it's been going strong. I'm knocking on wood ever since. Wow, that's that's quite a story. So how how were you accumulating these clients while you were still a student? Well, um, actually, I'd already graduated law school. Okay. I was looking for jobs. Mm-hmm. And it, here's the, the the first case, Chad. I went to get a haircut before my interview. Of course, no one told me how to dress. I, I, I No one told me that they didn't have any type of instruction as even how to do an interview. I'd never interviewed for a job in my life. Um, and I'm getting my haircut. And the hairdresser who'd been cutting my hair for the past three years during law school is talking to me about her son's circumcision that didn't go right. And I'm like leafing through the People magazine. I'm barely listening to it. And I, I, I don't want to say I could have cured Wes, but I didn't know why she's telling me about her son's circumcision. I'm just, okay, okay. And at the end of the thing, I'm, I'm like, uh, all right, we'll see you later. And she's like, wait a second, can't you help my son? And I said, with his circumcision, what what am I supposed to do? She goes, but aren't you a lawyer now? 
haven't you graduated law school? Aren't you a lawyer? It was the first time someone even suggested that to me. I was like, yes. Mm -hmm. I literally had my Florida bar card in my pocket to take it to get laminated. I had just received it. I probably showed it to her. And she says, well, maybe you can sue the hospital that didn't do the circumcision right on my son. I had, I had no idea how to do that. So I started taking this potential case with me to the interviews. This is how misguided I was, Chad. <laughs> I would go to a family law law firm and say, oh, by the way, I had this case with this circumcision. I'm talking to the wrong lawyers about the wrong case. I didn't even know. Until finally, um, I went and spoke to a lawyer who handles medical malpractice cases. And I tried to use this case as leverage for them to hire me to work on the case. And I'll never forget the uh, conversation. He says, we don't want the case. We don't want you or the case, but we'll tell you what to do. We'll tell you how to do it. I'll never forget this. And so the main guy didn't have the time to tell me what to do or how to do it. So he, he passed me on to some young lawyer. Now this is 30 something years ago. So that young lawyer is probably in his seventies now. And the main lawyer there has long since passed away. And they gave me forms. This predates word processing. They gave me forms. They gave me some statutes to look at. And I started suing the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital for this circumcision that had gone wrong. And I won the case. I don't know how. Well, it was, it was pretty much indefensible. It wasn't a big case, but it was indefensible. And they paid a lot of money and it got in the newspaper, not so much because there was so much money, but because some kid working out of the law school library took on this big hospital. And as a result of that publicity, all these lawyers in town started sending me their small cases that they didn't want. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know the difference between a good case or a bad case. So I, I just took them all. And uh, all of a sudden I had all these cases, most of them were awful. <laughs> I had nothing but time on my hands and a desire. And I started working up these small cases and I started hiring my classmates to help me take on all these small cases. And that's how it all sort of started. One circumcision gone wrong, changed wow. my life. Wow. Uh, so, you know, you, you've kind of become, uh, your reputation is one of a lawyer for the people. Um, are you, you told me about some of these awful cases that you just took when you were starting out. Um, yeah. maybe you didn't know any better. Are you more selective in terms of how you decide to take on cases now? Oh yeah. Um, much more selective, but I got into my mind somehow for most of my career that I owed it as an obligation to take on cases, regardless of the profitability of those cases. Um, and I practiced that way for a long, long time. And I think I believe in God. I, I think God benefited me from that because it taught me how to be a lawyer. So, you know, I, I took on a lot of really, really small bad cases in the beginning, but I got a lot of trial experience. As I got married and had children and, and had more expenses and decided to say, you know what? I don't want to uh, live in a completely financially stressed out existence all the time. I need to be more selective. And as I became more experienced, I was able to see, wait, 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 wait. this is a horrible case. And, 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 and learn to say no. Uh, but it was very hard for me to do that. And, and Chad, it took decades for me to be able to say no, because I was so honored that someone wanted me to be their lawyer after having the rejection of no one wanted to hire me. Now I got people asking me to be their lawyer and I, I just took on this, these small cases. So I became more selective as I became older, as I started to incur more financial responsibility uh, to my family and to myself. And, um, you know, I still once in a while take one on if it really bothers me. But I created a, a way to take on those cases that don't and won't bankrupt me. I created a non-for-profit called Lawyers to the Rescue. 
Mm -hmm. We are based in a homeless shelter here in Miami called the Camillus House. It's the largest homeless shelter in the Southeast United States. We have an office there and all the work is done, Chad, pro bono, which means that we don't charge anybody for anything that we do. Even when we get that money, we don't take a penny of it. And uh, this allows me to give it away, <laughs> like the Red Hot Chili Pepper song. I can give it away, give it away now and other lawyers to give it away. And it allows law students to come and learn how to give it away, which is something I fear is not necessarily being taught in our law schools now the importance of public service. So it, it gives this, and it, it creates a mentoring environment, which was so essential to my development, where we can sort of adopt young law students who see the value in pro bono service and teach them how to do it so that when they get out of law school, they know how to do it. So it's called Lawyers to the Rescue. It's a non-for-profit 5013C. The pandemic almost killed it because we couldn't get into the homeless shelter for years. So we were doing them remotely, like this conversation is on Zoom. It's It was very difficult. As if you can imagine the mm -hmm. continuity of representation of the homeless is extremely challenging, but when you're doing it remotely, they don't have access to cell phones and internet and it was very difficult. And I, I honestly had thought somewhat recently that maybe this is not something that can survive the pandemic. It's been going on for over 10, 13, 14 years, but it's, it's coming back little by little. So if anyone is watching this and is interested in where's the rescue, take a look at the website. You may be interested in creating something similar wherever you are. Yeah. What's the website? Lawyers to the rescue. I think it's .org or .com. Okay. Lawyers to the rescue. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, you know, as I mentioned in your intro, you are an international authority on holding cruise lines accountable. We talked about it a little bit earlier. What, uh, what kind of made you zero in on, on that? Well, Chad, I, so I was practicing 20 something years and um, got a, a significant cruise ship case in the office, which was very unusual because it's not something that I had much, if any, experience handling a really big case against a cruise line. And uh, I started working on it. And the cases are litigated in federal court. So already the the level of the judiciary in federal court is miles more sophisticated than the typical slip and fall on a banana peel at your local Piggly Wiggly case. So I go to federal court, which I, I had never been to. I go to federal court and the judge, who's now our chief judge, Cecilia Altanaga, well, I was so impressed by this judge. She knew the case. She knew the case better than I knew my own case. She she knew the law. And the and and the advocate on the other side was such a great lawyer. And and um I was like, wait a second, this seems to me like, you know, the NFL versus college. Um, it was a new level of sophistication. And I had to learn a new language because the federal rules of civil procedure, the federal evidence, all this is new. And it was exciting and challenging. And the dynamic for a guy who gets off on the David versus Goliath, Carnival Cruise Line, it's a country. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have more ships than most countries have in their navies. So, I mean, it, it's a country and they were so well funded. And the defense lawyer was who I, just sent a message to this morning, the same lawyer. I was so impressed by this guy, the level and the sophistication, and there's an international aspect to it, you know, witnesses in foreign countries. And I was like, wow, uh, this is something exciting and different for me. Um, there was a learning curve, <laughs> uh, and, and quite frankly, a terrified learning curve because the rules are different. And uh, it's federal court, there's no nonsense in there. And uh, it's not, the deadlines are, are deadlines. So like, if you miss a deadline, you're in big trouble. And I remember Judge Altanaga saying to me, Mr. Ehrenfeld, as we're approaching the trial, I just want you to know that the trial starts Monday. And I'm like, yes, Judge. She goes, wait a second. I want you to know the trial will start Monday. 
It's not like state court where they say the trial will start Monday and you get there and it doesn't start to two weeks or three weeks or a month, the continuances. When they say it's going to go, it goes. So uh, it was little things like that. And it moves very fast. You know, you file a case in federal court today, you'll have a trial date within a few months. You file a case in state court today, you may not have a trial date for a year or two. So it moves quickly. I liked it. It's exciting. It was something new to learn. And it's a challenge. It's extremely challenging. So I, I to me, it was like finding a gold ticket for Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. I, I, I found my where I was supposed to be. So what are the typical, if there are typical scenarios that would lead somebody to come to to an attorney like yourself after being on a cruise and having something happen? Like what's a what's a scenario that might happen on a cruise? Chad, I get this call four days, four times a day. Here, here's the typical of typical. I mean, this is what I would call the mundane cruise ship case. Little old lady from Wichita saves up her money to go on a cruise. She flies into Miami, boards this cruise ship. She's never seen anything like this in her life. Somebody tells her, you know, Mrs. Smith, in the morning, seven o'clock, out at the pool on the Lido deck, they have free coffee and donuts. She can't wait. She gets up the next morning. She's all excited. She puts on brand new flip flops that she bought at DSW, brand new for the cruise, had her nails done, pedicure. She goes out there, steps on that Lido deck. It's a combination of the sea salt air, the change in the interior to the exterior, and uh, they just mop the deck because it's early in the morning. They just mopped it. And she takes one step out of that fake teak floor and breaks her pelvis, breaks her arm, uh, breaks her ankle. She has no idea what happened. She wakes up in the medical center on the ship. She doesn't know what what, what what went wrong. She ends up getting dropped off in Cozumel, which is the next port. She's got to find her. She doesn't speak Spanish. She's got to find her way back to Wichita from Cozumel. Most of these folks buy travel insurance, so they get an air ambulance or something to take them back to Wichita. They get surgery in Wichita. The family members say, you know what? You ought to sue the cruise line. She's never sued anyone in her life. In fact, she's never had a lawyer in her life. But they keep saying something, you got to do something, something. Finally, the son calls me. Or the son calls a lawyer in Wichita who doesn't do cruise ship stuff. And then that lawyer calls me and says, hey, would you be interested in a case like this? And I'm like, we got 300 of them, just like that. Same ship, our same class of ships. Um, and, and so this lady who's never had a lawsuit in her life is now in a federal lawsuit against Carnival Cruise Line. And man, they defend these very, very aggressively. And uh, and quite frankly, they 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 do beat them up a little bit. Uh, they don't make it easy on the on the little old lady. They make her fly to Miami several times and come into Miami from Wichita. We might as well be going to San Jose, Costa Rica, because this is this is an exotic destination for her. Mm-hmm. And 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 ultimately, most of the time, it, the case will settle. Uh, and most of the time the case settles because they're so worn out, our clients from all this, that they're 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 willing to take uh what is being offered or a, a reasonable offer. Occasionally I'll get one that has the strength to go the distance, but most of them, most of these cases do resolve before jury trial because they make it so financially and emotionally difficult to sue them. So they're not settling because they're not settling because of the amount being offered. They're settling just to get it over with. Well, it, the, the, most of the time we can get Carnival to pay more than they really want to, and most of our clients, most of them, are very reasonable people. It's a very different dynamic. Most, not all, of a cruise ship passenger than someone who slips and falls at Target. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are, most of these people have health insurance. Most of them are often retired. Uh, so, you know, the, they don't have a loss of income claim, uh, and they're not litigious people. Uh, very rarely do we have a client who's had a prior lawsuit or prior accidents, uh, mm-hmm. in a cruise ship case. You take the same 
situation if somebody slips and falls at Target, and this will be their, they've had two car accidents, three prior slip and falls, you know, they're more litigious. These are different folks. And the, the part that really concerns me is they're not from Miami. They don't look like they're from Miami. They don't talk like they're from Miami. And it's hard to get a jury necessarily to feel the same degree of connectedness to some little lady from Wichita who, you know, doesn't, who's not from here. They're the away team. Carnival is very much the home team in Miami. They have a huge presence mm. in Miami. There's buildings all over South Florida that say Carnival on them. In, in fact, Chad, that homeless shelter used to say Norwegian Cruise Line on the top of it. Uh, it doesn't anymore, and I don't think Norwegian ever figured out that I was actually officing in there, but that homeless shelter was sponsored by Norwegian Cruise Line. So if you live in Miami, you're going to see advertisements for all the cruise lines on all the billboards, and you see the ships all the time because the port of Miami is here. And uh, either you work at Carnival, know someone who worked on Carnival, or you go on a Carnival. So oh, wow. it, it's 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 a tough you're you're the away team whenever you come to Miami to sue a cruise line. So given the I guess that that inherent difficulty and the desire sometimes for the client to settle, would you as as a confident attorney who's gone up against these uh, large entities, would you prefer always to take them all the way to the, the distance or is settling something you don't mind? So I've learned, that's a great question, Chad. I've learned to put my personal desires aside as best I can. I will tell them what my personal desires are, but I'll always say, hey, Chad, this is your case. These are your risks. Do you really want to spend a week with me in Miami in a courtroom? Um, and, and by the way, and I'm glad this is being recorded, most of the federal judges do not like or want to be listening to a cruise ship case. They did not become federal judges because some little lady from Wichita slipped on the Lido deck. They resent it, most of them. And most of them will make it very difficult for that little lady to get her day in court because they know she's taking up a week of their value, invaluable time uh, to hear a slip and fall, and they don't like it. So unless we have the right judge, that's one of the first things I look at is do we have a judge who will give my client a fair day in court? And not all of them will. Um, and I have the client who's willing to go the distance and risk because Carnival will make an offer at one point that they have to weigh the risks versus the benefits. They, they're, mm -hmm. Carnival's very strategic. At some point, they'll make an offer. It won't be this humongous amount of money, but is it worth risking going to Las Vegas and, and rolling the wheel, you know, when you've got chips on the table. And most of these people are not risk takers. But I always will tell them my my thoughts. Uh, but it's them, it's their case, and it's their life. And I got hundreds of cases. But I would rather be in trial more. But it takes a really special individual that's willing to, like, go the distance. Sure. And uh, I have that, one more question. Far between yeah, 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 I would imagine. I have one more question for you, but uh, first just tell me how people can find out more about um, Aaron Feld Trial Lawyers. Obviously, you don't have to be a Miami resident based on some of the stories you've told. So yeah, let, let us know. Yeah, very rarely, by the way, thank you, Chad, are any of my clients from South Florida. I have one now, and, uh, and the case is going to mediation on Friday. I'm so excited because I could say to Carnival, take a look at this lady. Because this this lady is Miami. Uh, everyone's going to know someone like her, or everyone on that jury is going to be her, or are seen someone like her before. So I'm very excited. So to find me, you can go on the website, aaronfeld.com. I'm very active on social media. I don't know if your listeners follow the TikTok, uh, but I have hundreds of thousands of followers on TikTok. I post daily cruise ship law stories on TikTok. So you can check that out. I'm on Instagram as well. Um, but AaronFeld.com is probably the easiest way to, to find us and to reach us. Okay, great. Uh, we were talking about going the distance. I know you, I read that you are an avid marathon runner. Does that yeah. kind of um, discipline, ability, willingness to go that distance kind of translate into your professional life? 
Chad, excellent question. There's so many similarities that I find in distance running and trial work. Um, it's and it's all in the head. <laughs> you know, there's there's a lot of voices in my head when I'm running long distances that tell me to stop or that it hurts too much. Um, and you have to silence those voices and that I can do this. Uh, um, it's a dialogue. And I have that dialogue with myself with cases. You know, it's too hard. It's too risky. Uh, it's too expensive. These cases cost me on the average about $50,000 to $100,000 per case to get to trial. And so the voices are in my head, just like when I'm running, pull over. Um, and, you, and I've learned to silence them. There's a lot of similarities I have found between the pain of running races and the pain of trying cases. I love them both. And it sure as feels good when you get to the finish line. Uh, but there, there's a, there's a big conversation I have in my head, mile after mile. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I don't doubt it. Hey, uh, Spencer, it's been great to talk to you. I can see why you are Me one too, of Florida's yeah. most intriguing people. Thanks so much for your time and all <laughs> for your insight. Oh, it's absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to 15 minutes. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time.